Hello, hello everybody. Uh, you're with the American Battlefield Trust. I'm Gary Edelman and Chris White, who's behind the camera there, um, and I have been just doing all sorts of sights on our western swing. As we went through West Virginia, we went uh, through central Kentucky, if that's what it's called, all the way out to Munfordville, and now we're swinging all the way back. So we're starting to our return trip as we continue to hit more sites, and now we are at Camp Nelson in Kentucky. It is now has a different name, Camp Nelson National Monument. So it's very exciting to be here at this time. Uh, we're going to talk about this place. Hopefully you'll learn something new and hopefully you'll visit. So with no further ado, let me bring on our friend. It's good to run into friends along the way. Ernie Price, you might know him from a bajillion years at Appomattox. He is now superintendent of the new Camp Nelson National Monument. Thank you. Gary, thank you so much. Yes, welcome to Camp Nelson National Monument and so many people and organizations have made this happen over the years, and so it's thrilling to stand here and be able to say that. Uh, but I should note that it's new to the National Park Service, but it's not a new park. Uh, Jesmond County, Kentucky really deserves the lion's share of the credit for recognizing the significance of this acreage, and starting in the 1990s, began accumulating the land that would become, uh, in 2018, Camp Nelson National Monument. And so right now, we're literally the National Park Service and Jesmond County, we're co-managing this site as part of a three-year agreement. And on October 1, 2021, it'll be up to the Park Service to, to completely take the reins. And so I have the honor to be here now uh, to move that process along. So uh, we're here, we're about 20 miles or so south of Lexington, Kentucky, right along Highway 27. So we're actually pretty easy to get to. Um, kind of between Lexington and Danville. And that's a big reason why this camp is here. Uh, the highway that runs right in front of us is the same road corridor that was here in 1863 and that attracted the federal engineers to say, hey, if we need a supply depot to support efforts into Tennessee, North Georgia, even Southwest Virginia, this would be a good place to do it because of access to the road. Also, water is always important, isn't it? Everywhere we go and it's no different here. Hickman Creek runs to the east side of this camp. The Kentucky River runs to the west side. They meet uh, just south of where we're standing right now. And in this land that we're standing on between these two bodies of water, which it makes it a very defensible position, these palisades are huge that run along these creeks and the river. Uh, camp Nelson became the spot. Also near here at that time was the only bridge over the Kentucky River in this corridor. Uh, the, the Hickman Creek Bridge. So uh, that's why we're here. That's why we're standing at this spot. And just really quick, because we want to talk about the house behind us a little bit, but you know, there are a lot of camps. There are a lot of defensible yeah. camps. Um, but, but this one became a national monument, not Camp Dick Robinson, not a lot of the other camps around here. Why is this one a national monument? Why is this one special? Well, <clears throat> I think it's very special for a lot of reasons, but the number one reason there are hundreds of camps uh, developed, supply depots, etc. Even though this was built to be a supply depot to support missions into the further south, that's not what it became known as. Kentucky is, as you know, is very special in that it's a slaveholding state and the Emancipation Proclamation did not apply to Kentucky. So you have this federal installation right here in central Kentucky surrounded by slaveholding counties and farms and the next thing you know, in, in the middle of 1863, when this camp was established, it didn't take long for people to start coming to the camp. And so, in, in fact, sometimes it was even referred to as Canada because here you could maybe self-emancipate. And so you have not just the men that would become United States color troops that Camp Nelson is known for, but women and children, families are showing up here, not dozens or hundreds, but thousands but when they get here, it's very uncertain what's gonna to happen to them. And I think that's one of the messages we'd like to share with people is that we know how the story ends, but the people that came here in 1863, 64, and 65, they're taking a chance. They don't know how the story is gonna end, but they made the decision to come anyway. And there are eight United States Colored Troop regiments that are raised here in Camp Nelson. Started as a supply depot, but ended up becoming the third or possibly arguably even the second largest recruiting station for USCTs anywhere in the country. And I, I think that's really cool. This is why I like coming here. We're going to start walking in a second, but you know, so you've got this story of freedom, but you've also got 
all that also comes with a camp at a supply depot. You have white regiments training here as well. You have very interesting stories with the horses and the stabling and innovation with those horses. You have stories of water and everything. So we're gonna walk through the camp, but first, what, what's the structure here? So the structure behind me, uh, I think more technically should be called the Oliver Perry House. But at the time, and even here locally now, it's more commonly known as the White House, uh, lowercase t. Um, so, but, but the significance to the park today is that this is the only historic structure that survives. It was built in the mid 1850s uh, by the Perry family. And, uh, but in 1863, the federal government comes in takes over the home and it becomes officers, officer quarters for the camp. And so today, as we walk along the landscape, which we'll be doing here shortly, there's a lot of archeological sites, there are earthen forts, there's plenty of things to discuss on the landscape, but the only thing that you can architecturally, physically see or potentially walk into is the White House. So it's a connection for us, a tangible connection back to the 1863 landscape. All right, good, so I'm, I'm really glad that we have it. That's that's what a, what a gem. Um, Ernie, while we walk, could you give an idea, if somebody was walking here past the White House in 1864, what would they have seen around them? What, what, what's the camp looking like? How big is it? You know, one thing that impresses me is that we have, uh, oh, there's over 40 photographs that are taken while the camp is functioning. So uh, that that's really awesome. And you can see what the camp looked like. Uh, in, in, in traditional Civil War photography fashion. Now, we don't just see the landscape like you would of a battlefield after the battlefield, after the battle's over. We actually see the camp functioning with people and animals uh, working. One thing that surprises me, whenever I think of Civil War armies being in a location, I imagine them cutting down all the trees and using up the fences and just basically scorching the landscape of everything that was usable. Here, I think it's really cool that they intentionally left trees. I constantly see those in the photographs and I'm thinking that's pretty smart. I would have done the same thing too because it gets hot here in the summer. Um, so you would see trees, but, but, but a largely open like it is now with trees smattered about. Um, you would see a lot of wooden structures that look a lot like the one right here. Now this is a reconstruction. We call it the barracks because that's what it's meant to look like. And these things were put up very quickly, uh, but they're quite functional. To, to house soldiers, uh, all kinds of government shops to make wagons and wheels and, and bakeries to make bread and stations to pump water and hospitals and prisons. And I mean, it's basically a city. Uh, there are times when Camp Nelson could have been nearly the second largest city in Kentucky when it was at its peak. Yeah, and what are we talking about? We don't know, 5,000 people? Uh, how many people are here? I mean, even an estimate. Yeah, you know, and that's the thing, right? When we when we look at Civil War battlefields and order of battles, you know, we want to nail down the number of soldiers that are in that unit and how many were engaged and how many were in reserve. That's a difficult thing to do at Camp Nelson because it's very fluid. It's always changing. Um, as I said, you know, you've got, you've got enslaved people that are making their way into the camp randomly on a daily basis. Uh, there are some days in the summer of 1864, you could have hundreds that show up in a day. Um, and the same is also true with soldiers that are forming, units are forming. There are other units that serve in Camp Nelson that didn't form here. They came from other places. So any, the thing about Camp Nelson, when you imagine being here at the time, is how dynamic it was. It changed dramatically. The number of buildings that were built and constructed changed almost before your eyes. The number of people that were in the camp changed daily almost before your eyes. So I hesitate to say, oh yeah, there were 8,000 people here. There could have been as few as a couple thousand in a given moment. There might have been as many as 10,000 in a different moment. For example, in 1864, there was a moment when the camp thought that it might be attacked by Confederates. There was, it was, a, there was information that there were Confederates in the area. At that moment, there were virtually no soldiers in the camp. They were all out. And so what were left were civilians. The camp had 600 good arms available. So they issued them to 600 civilians and they went out wow. and they staffed the forts bracing for this attack that thankfully never came. But it's just an example of how some days it wasn't that many, and other days it could be just a, a, a hustling, bustling city of industry uh, and activity. So very dynamic. This is it's so interesting to me. And, you know, we're going to go into the barracks in a second. But, um, you know, 
I find it fascinating. You know, we at the Trust, we run events. By the way, you're with the American Battlefield Trust. We are at Camp Nelson <coughs> National Monument. That's a new designation. We're really happy to be here with Superintendent Ernie Price. And when the Trust runs come to some of our medium-sized events, we have, you know, 200 people show up or something like that. I mean, the work that goes into taking care of those people, not even having to deal with the hotel stuff, yeah. just the feeding and the buses and the emergency, you know, necessities and whatnot. And you say that a few hundred, you know, enslaved might show up in one day or something. Right. So, I mean, you know, I guess they have a way, some sort of a system to, okay, we're going to house you. And then we're going to look at the males of appropriate age and look right. at you as possible soldiers. Yes, absolutely. And so that's why, that's how the supply depot becomes a recruiting station. It wasn't by design, it was by necessity. And so as these men come in, the families come in, the men of fighting age that are, are healthy enough uh, are, are pulled into service. You know, that, that dynamic thing that I keep talking about is not only the landscape or the number of people, but it's also the, the way people lived and what you got up in the morning and thought and what you thought that night when you went to bed. You know, if, if you put yourself, try to put yourself, which it's impossible for us to do today in 2020, but if you think about coming into this camp, trying to self-emancipate, it could literally depend on who's in charge of the camp that day, that week, that month. That changed too, by the way. <laughs> wow. And so the federal government's inability in 1863 or 1864 to have a uniform policy and understanding of what did it mean if enslaved people showed up to a federal camp, did it mean they were emancipated? Not everybody agreed, not even within the government, not even among these different camps. So, <coughs> excuse me, the people that came into these camps, they lived with that uncertainty every day. It could be, hey, you're in this camp, you're, you're able to work and be paid for that work. Next day it could be, yeah, no, you're not gonna get paid for that work. But you do have to do the work. You gotta do the work regardless. <laughs> and by the way, these forts that are out here, built with enslaved labor. There's the irony, right? This place is full of those kind of, of, of ironic complexities, which all good history seems to be. You may get paid one day, you may not the next. Um, you may be able to open up your own business and sell things or be laundry or cook food or do whatever, maybe work in an officer's quarters to, you might get paid for that, next day you might not. Um, you, if you become a soldier, you can be emancipated. Maybe your family can, next day, no, maybe they're not that kind of uncertainty. And so when I said earlier that we know how this ended, the people doing this didn't. This is an incredible amount of uncertainty. But, you know, one, one man was asked after the war in reflecting back on this time, um, you know, hey, how is it any different to get up in the morning and work all day and not get paid? How is that really any fundamentally different from being enslaved? And he said, I'd rather do it here. <laughs> I suppose he meant because of what it might turn into. And I would say he was right. But again, uncertainty. So speaking of living day to day, uh, let's take a look at the barracks, or at least a, a, a very modern example of barracks. I, I like this idea that Ernie and the park and the interpreters here. This was a, uh, you know, a, a, a historic site for many times before. You don't necessarily have all the answers. <laughs> you know, you're you're trying to extrapolate by looking at what the issues are and the uncertainties. I I like that. At a lot of sites, interpreters like to say, "This is how it was." I, I kind of like that we have to explore it ourselves. Oh yeah, absolutely. Now this is a modern adaptation. It's an educational space, but it gives you can imagine being able to bring a school group uh, inside here or other visitors to begin to talk about what did it mean to live in barracks. And so this is obviously, there's a lot of anachronisms here, but, um, it, but it's the beginnings of what could be a, an awesome resource that you can walk into and be a part of. Like I said before, that's like the White House. If something is tangible, you can go into. This could become that too. Uh, and so the Park Service, you know, we're looking at, at this as, a, as an opportunity uh, to allow people not just to see barracks in a photograph or walk over the archaeological space where one existed, but actually think a little bit about what it meant to, to live in a space like this. Very cool. I also see, you know, just everywhere I go, I, I'm remembering, I haven't been here in a while, but now I'm remembering, there's an interpretation, a little, small interpretive sign about the ventilation. I mean, yes. the things you would never think about here. And when I look about it, like when I see kind of, you know, history people, I go to a Civil War convention or something, there's the collectors. And then there's the people who like to focus on letters. And then there's the people who like to focus on the blood and guts. And then there's, and that's what you get here, I remember. And we'll, we might do a separate video where we'll go into the visitor center and see some of the exhibits there. I mean, 
you've got everything here. No matter what you're interested in, no matter, let me say it in a different voice, no matter what you're interested in, you can find it at Camp Nelson National Monument. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I've, thought, I've already thought the same thing. Um, to me, this camp gives us a chance to, look, I, I, we, know, we love the, the importance and the sacredness of our battlefield. So this isn't meant to be a comparison to battlefields. But my point is, it's so different from a battlefield. And here, I think you have a great opportunity to explore how are these battles fought? Where do the men come from? The clothes on their backs, the guns that they're wearing, the ammunition that they're using, the equipment that they use to campaign on with. Where's all that stuff coming from? The quartermasters and commissaries and this supply depot like this answers that question. But in the case of Camp Nelson, you also can unpack, and why are they doing it? It all can be explored here, and it's a powerful, powerful place. That's great, man. We're now going to check out a little bit more of the camp. You're with the American Battlefield Trust. We are with Superintendent Ernie Price here at the Camp Nelson National Monument uh, south of Lexington, Kentucky. Now, I don't know if the sun's behind me here, but uh, <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're kind of walking overland now. And if you, not if, but when you visit Camp Nelson National Monument, um, we've shown you the White House. You've seen the barracks. Um, you'll also have a chance to see the visitor center. So those are the buildings really most associated with the park experience today. However, between four and 500 acres, which is what the park is in size, is mostly what you see out here uh, off to my right, which is this beautiful pastoral landscape. Uh, but it's dotted with earthen uh, forts and uh, a lot of interpretive panels, wayside panels that you see at, at, at a lot of national parks. Jesmond County's done a wonderful job of putting some of those out here too. Uh, about 30 of them, honestly, and, and I think they're, they're well done. But when you walk out to one of these sites and you'll see these waysides way out there on the landscape, and when you do, um, you're rewarded because these signs will talk to you about what's there. And, 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 in, and in a lot of cases, there'll even be a photograph which, I, again, I just think is really cool that we can do yeah, that. Yeah, I'd like to support that <laughs> suggestion. And, and by the way, you know, Ernie, while we're walking around here, it could be now or later, but let me give you a choice. You know, I'd like you to talk a little bit more if we have time about a little more about horses and a little more about water because they're associated with this camp. Yeah, so, um, you know, Gary was talking earlier about uh, the ventilation uh, in the barracks. And so because Camp Nelson is this heavy concentration uh, of people in one place. And you know, you see this all over the Civil War, right? Um, and, and, the, and, and trying to understand diseases and, and how they spread and, and um, sanitary conditions. And you know, these, these are people that have probably never been around this many people at one time before in their lives. And it's very problematic. Um, and, and what we're gonna see is that daily life uh, in Camp Nelson is, is hard and death is common and developing understandings of, of health and sanitary conditions are grow with the camp. So um, the barracks that we just saw, for example, that was, that was the first idea was to build barracks. And so we're, we're looking at the camp here where the soldiers worked and served and trained. But there's a whole nother part of the park that is actually the location of what's known as the home for colored refugees. And there, that's where here at Camp Nelson, uh, the authorities decided that, okay, we don't know what's going to happen to the women and children uh, of the families of these soldiers, whether they're ultimately going to be emancipated or not. But if they're here, they need to live somewhere. And so they built barracks. Um, studies show, though, that the barracks maybe not were not the healthiest because um, they, they tended to not be as ventilated as well. And so then the decision was made to build individual cottages. Uh, imagine 16 by 16 foot cottages that could house a lot of people. Um, but, but they were actually uh, healthier than the large barracks with everybody in there all together. There's, another, there's some other research that suggests that some of the people that actually ended up living in tents, uh, tent, you know, just like you would see uh, the, the military do, um, that they actually were healthier because they were more isolated rather than living in large numbers. Um, so there's a lot learned there. The other thing in the camp with all these people is logistics. Uh, not only the health, but things like water and food, of course. 
we're going to head over here to this obelisk. Um, so one of the one of the greatest innovations here at Camp Nelson was running water inside the camp. Now, I, I'm not sure that I was prepared to learn about that when I got here. But as I said earlier, the Kentucky River runs not far from here uh, on the, the western boundary of the camp. And uh, you should know that it's not just a river. Uh, the way the geology is around here, it cuts a tremendous palisade. Uh, there's uh, there almost 400 feet high. So it's very difficult to access the river, which is why it made it a great defensible feature topographically to put the camp here, but it also made it really difficult to get to the water that's in the river. But enter, enter a war and innovation, and the next thing you know, there's a solution. So literally there was a steam uh, engine that was installed down at the river's edge, and uh, there was 400 feet of, of pipe put in to go up the Palisades and the water's pumped into an area over by the colored refugee home, which is an area known as the Hall community today. Uh, and there, there was a reservoir and the water was pumped into a giant reservoir. And from there, there were pipes, lead pipes that would run into the camp and they were gravity fed. So the water was actually running into the camp just to key spots. I mean, not everybody had it, but you know, there's a bakery here and they could produce 10,000 loaves of bread a day. I mean, this is almost reminiscent of Petersburg, City Point, you know, and the way, the way you think about these numbers, uh, it's mind boggling. And uh, hospitals, prisons, uh, all these things. I think one of the other great innovations that should be recognized here is, you know, we are in central Kentucky and this is horse country. It has been for a long time. Here at Camp Nelson, great innovations in the areas of horses and mules. Again, we talked about at Camp Nelson, you can not only explore why the war was fought and, and what the outcome would mean, but you can explore the logistics of how the war was fought. Um, not only the why, but the how. Horses and mules, huge. Here at Camp Nelson, we're six miles south of Nicholasville, Kentucky. Uh, from there, supplies could be brought in for the camp. That was great, but you had to get the supplies from there to here and uh, massive amounts of horses and mules were used to do that, wagons, etc. But also, the, the camp was responsible for supplying those horses and mules and wagons for the troops that were headed south on campaigns. Soldiers, uh, this supply depot would directly support activities at Knoxville, the Atlanta campaign, and Saltville battles in southwest Virginia. So, uh, you had horses coming and going, wagons and supplies coming and going. This was a great location for camp because of the rivers and the palisades that I've mentioned, access to the, the, the Lexington Danville Road. But others afterwards would decide that it wasn't that great because although you had this great supply depot, the roads going south got increasingly worse. Imagine those trips to Knoxville and all the thousands of men and horses that were using that road. It became almost impassable at certain times of the year. Um, others would later be critical of the location actually and so when you talk about the Atlanta campaign a lot of the supplies at Camp Nelson were actually sent to the railroad um, and, and then sent down from Louisville down to Chattanooga to support the campaign that way they didn't actually use the roads going south here so again dynamic things are changing but back to the horses and mules you needed thousands upon thousands to conduct all this business and so something that was learned during the Civil War here at Camp Nelson, and this idea would spread to other areas, um, was that, yes, we're going to use horses and mules and we're going to use them hard. A lot of them are going to get spent. They're going to get used up and, and, and frankly, disposed of, um, as, as harsh as that sounds. But that was the business of war. However, at Camp Nelson, the idea surfaced that, you know, wait a minute, perhaps we can contract with the infinite number of farmers uh, that 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 are are that know horses uh, and mules around this area, and when these animals start to become broken down, they can actually be sent out to be uh, to recoup, and uh, it worked. And they actually came up with diets uh, and exercise uh, uh, routines that would work for this. And they would send these these horses and animals out, mules out. Later, they would come back into the camp, and they were found to be as good as new. And it was actually cheaper than trying to get brand new animals and just throwing the old ones away. Wow. So, you know, and, and here at Camp Nelson, you could corral up to 12,000 horses at once and you could stable 
2,000 at once. Now again, the number would change as they needed, but that's the kind of capacity we're talking here. That's real capacity. So let's you know wrap this up because you know, we, we talked about all the innovation and the training and everything like this, but you know, you put a lot of people together in questionable conditions sometimes, and some aren't going to make it, you know, a, a, a lot, especially if, you know, the enslaved came in unhealthy to start with. Um, and then, you know, there's going to be danger in anything, and especially in life in the 1860s. So the place we're standing at is relevant to that, as well as a more distant spot that we can see from here. So Ernie? Yeah, so... You know, like like all of all of our important Civil War sites, they all have legacies too. You know, there's the thing that happened in the 1860s, and then there's what it meant going forward. This is a very powerful spot to talk about that. Uh, I mentioned earlier about camp commanders changing and U.S. government policies changing regarding the fate of, of formerly enslaved people, and what did it mean that they had come into a federal uh, installation like Camp Nelson, and and often they didn't know. Well, in November of 1864, there was a commander that came into the camp who decided that it was not the government's responsibility to take care of the women and children that were here, even if their husbands were fighting as soldiers in the army. And so in November of 64, um, he expelled uh, a lot of the women and children from the camp. And, you know, we're actually standing here on a November day in Camp Nelson right now, as I talk to you. But November, like Camp Nelson itself, is very dynamic. It can be 75 degrees one day, it could be raining and 40 degrees the next day. In fact, that may happen. Um, unfortunately, when these, when these women and children were expelled from the camp, uh, the expulsion it's known as, it wasn't a day like this. Uh, it was below freezing. And as they walked out of the camp, uh, within the next 24, 48 hours, some of them would perish tragically, um, upwards of 102. Uh, of these folks would die in, in by exposure. And it's just a reminder of how tragic these stories are and how common death was uh, at Camp Nelson. There isn't always a happy ending to every story in American history, but I think it's important to note that those folks that died in that November of 64 would spark real change in the nation. There were other people here that, of course, disapproved of that, and they would write letters to newspapers up north in New York. And this story would blow up, if you will. It became viral 1864 style. And what happened was the nation, enough of the nation was outraged at this, at this action that by March of 1865, Congress would pass a law saying that any enslaved person that made their way to a federal camp like Camp Nelson would be emancipated and treated that way. <clears throat> and remember, before March of 1865, that was not a foregone conclusion. So out of this tragedy did come some, at least one step uh, for positive change. Now, the obelisk that's right behind me is here because of this, this area that we're standing in. Camp Nelson, like I said, death was common. And so men, women, and children died every day in Camp Nelson uh, from all these reasons that we've talked about. And they were buried here in what's called cemetery number one. Um, there were hundreds of graves here. We don't know an exact number, <clears throat> and they're not marked today. However, <clears throat> what we do know, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's walk on up a little. Yeah, sure. What we do know, what we do know is that after the war, 217 of the Union soldiers that were known to be buried here were reinterred south of here maybe a third, half a mile south of here, and what would become cemetery number two, which today is known as Camp Nelson National Cemetery. So not only do we have a military cemetery to our south, not only is that cemetery, does it exist on the land that was part of Camp Nelson at the time, but the original soldiers that were buried in that cemetery were soldiers from Camp Nelson. But mind you, they're not all African American. Um, as we said earlier, there are actually white units that form here too. And in this cemetery, it was an integrated cemetery. And both white Tennessee soldiers and USCT soldiers uh, that, that formed here at Camp Nelson were reinterred down at the camp. And when you go down into the National Cemetery, what would become the National Cemetery? And when you go down there today, ask to see the old section of the cemetery. It looks very much like the rest of the cemetery, but as you walk those rows, you'll see there are USCT soldiers a row, and then there's a row of white soldiers, and then there's a row of USCT soldiers. 
uh, right there and, and what would become what is today in 2020 still an active cemetery. Uh, so it's not uncommon to hear a 21 gun salute down there on a given afternoon while you're here at Camp Nelson. And it's quite powerful uh, on its own, but to know how indelibly linked that cemetery is with this spot here in the camp uh, is just a reminder that this history and this legacy is, is still, still with us and still, still developing. But thanks so much, Ernie. This is um, a story that's at, at once, you know, it's inspiring and tragic, and uncertain and confusing. And this is exactly what we need to be exploring, I think, today. So um, thank you, Ernie. Congratulations on this designation as a, a new uh, national monument here at Camp Nelson. Uh, thank you all for watching. And maybe I can induce Chris White to take a few steps as we go out in a moment of Zen and focus in on the distant National Cemetery.